so, so uh, John, I'm going to introduce you, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, I, I want to say to our uh, to everybody out there. Uh, by the way, John, we have people who attend these meetings and actually listen to our recordings from all over the world, which I I just think is amazing. We have people in Ceylon, if you can oh, imagine wow. that, who will listen to your program. <laughs> Hi, to all the folks out there in Ceylon. Uh, I want to say that I'm very excited about tonight's talk because. Uh, I'm a big fan of, as a lot of our members know, of extrasolar discovery of ex discovery of extrasolar planets. Uh, we've had a number of talks on this, and I just because it is like science fiction. I mean, we are discovering planetary systems that would be right in there with some of the systems that are described in your favorite Star Trek episode. And it is, and uh, so tonight, John is going to talk about some of this stuff. And I mean, it, it's it's. It's real, folks. It's absolutely real. And John has just mentioned to me that we're now over 5,000 extrasolar planets and that they are everywhere. And uh, I mean, this is really, really exciting. If you're not excited about this, nothing's going to get you excited. Um, I also, I just want to say, again, for, for those of you that have heard me say this before, um, EAS has a special link, especially with Kepler, because on the original Kepler website, uh, the picture of the field, the Kepler field, was taken by our former president, Carter Roberts, at the uh, Barcraft High Altitude uh, Star Party that we have every year up at 12,000 feet up in the White Mountains. And if you've never been to that star party, I highly recommend it because the stars will just blow you away. Um, but anyway, now to, on to tonight's speaker. So I'm going to talk a little bit about John. He's a research scientist and project manager at NASA Ames Research Center in the Advanced Supercomputing Division, where he conducts research on data processing and detection algorithms for discovering transiting extrasolar planets. He is the co-investigator, which means he's a really important guy, for data processing for the Kepler mission and for NASA's TESS mission, which is e doing even more amazing work, uh, launched in 2018 to identify Earth's nearest neighbors for follow-up and characterization. And folks, we're talking about like James Webb Space Telescope characterization, where you can look at the atmospheres of these planets and look for signatures of what's in those atmospheres, which is really, really exciting. Uh, uh, John uh, has led the design, development, and operation of the of the data science pipelines for both Kepler and TESS. He got his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, a BS in, uh, in applied mathematics, a master's of science degree in electrical engineering, John, you're an overachiever, and a PhD in electrical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. So John is a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. By the way, John, did you know that synthetic rubber was discovered by one of the professors at Georgia Tech? in the I did <laughs> and and that that man was the uncle of a good friend of mine who went to this school that I've got on my shirt so anyway so without further ado uh Dr. John from NASA Ames go ahead John all right well thank you very much uh th thanks Dave and Richard um let's see there we go looks good John all right. All right, fantastic. It's uh, my great honor and privilege to be here with you tonight to talk about Chasing Shadows in the Night, how NASA's Kepler and TESS missions are revolutionizing exoplanet science. So um, uh, we should all cast our minds back to 1994 when uh, this was a picture of all the known planets that we knew in the universe. Uh, we lost one of them. <laughs> Pluto got demoted, so it's a dwarf planet now, just uh, an exemplar of a large collection of similar bodies in the outer solar system. Um, dwarf planets are planets too, so I don't think uh, it was too much of a demotion. Of course, it's a very fascinating place. Um, uh, a few years later, though, this was a more recent picture of planets in 2012, so Kepler had launched in 2009, and at this time, uh, when XKCD published this cartoon. This was all 786 known planets drawn to scale. And so if you squint and look quite closely, you can see a picture of our own solar system in this cartoon. And I'll zoom in so that you can help find it. This little gray rectangle contains Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the terrestrial bodies in our solar system. And what you notice when you look at this cartoon was that for the first several years, that we were uh, finding planets, we were finding planets typically that were much larger than the planets in our own solar system. You can see that Jupiter is much smaller than many of the planets in this cartoon. So um, that just goes to say that the first planets we found uh, 
uh, through astronomy were planets that were much larger than our own typically, and also much closer to their stars. But that's because those were the easiest ones to find. So now Kepler's mission was to determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. And so we have to talk about what does what's habitability, right? And so that means we wanna be at the right temperature. So you want a, a planet that's uh, close enough to its star, but not too close so that liquid water could pool on the surface of a rocky planet like Earth. We want the planet to have a, a envelope of, of air and atmosphere, uh, liquid water, of course. Um, certainly almost all uh, organisms depend on water at some point in their life cycle. Uh, we need light, of course, for photosynthesis. We need a radiation shield. So having an atmosphere helps, having a strong magnetic field helps. And uh, asteroid protection. So again, the atmosphere plays a strong role there. And in our own solar system, Jupiter helps out, but of course, Jupiter was a bully in the early uh, portion of the solar system formation. Jupiter sent a lot of comets our way. <clears throat> right, so I talked about this a little bit. Um, Venus is, is too hot. We, we take uh, early Venus as the inner edge of the optimistic habitable zone. Uh, we believe that liquid water exists on Venus for quite some time before it all, all escaped, uh, essentially, Hydrogen makes it up to, uh, excuse me, water makes it up to the ionosphere of upper atmosphere of Venus and uh, gets dissociated and uh, the hydrogen escapes never to come back. And so over time, Venus lost all its water. In fact, that was my first job as a, as, uh, during my PhD was to study the abundance of sulfuric acid in the um, atmosphere of Venus. Um, mm -hmm. A very unhospitable world for us today, hot enough to melt lead. And then we've got Mars, which is um, at kind of at the outer edge of the habitable zone, the optimistic habitable zone. Uh, Mars has a couple of problems with, and that is it's too small to hold on to a thick, abundant atmosphere like Venus or Earth, and uh, it's it's too cold today. But there may have been ancient life on Venus on on Mars that arose that we can find, and so that's of course an area of inquiry and, and active study. But we're fortunate ourselves to live on Earth, which is just right, at least for now. So stars come in different colors and sizes. So the larger, brighter stars uh, are, are hotter. And uh, that means that the habitable zone is further away from those stars. Whereas for sun-like stars, a medium-sized star like the sun, uh, you know, we're at the uh, inner edge of the habitable zone ourselves in, a, in an orbit that's 93 million miles from the sun. And then we've got cooler stars like uh, M dwarfs, which are quite popular with exoplanet scientists today because it because they're smaller. Um, the planets can be much closer. Typical uh, M star is between something like a quarter and a half the size mass of the sun and can have habitable zones uh, with orbital periods for a planet of typically something like 17, 20 days, 30, 34, that kind of thing. So, so M stars um, afford us great opportunities to study um, uh, habitable zone planets um, much easier than we can for the bigger, brighter stars. Now, it was a really long road to Kepler being selected for launch. In fact, this is a uh, page out of NASA's 1995 Exploring Nearby Planetary Systems Report. This was a study that was uh, arranged by Harley Thronson at headquarters. Um, he assigned it to JPL. They carried out a study about a year, over about a year. They asked for contributions from the community. This was uh, the first uh, extrasolar planet meeting that I went to. And at the time I was a member of a small group of scientists who were um, interested in finding transiting planets around the smallest known eclipsing binary at the time known as CM Draconis. Um, uh, we started doing this work in 1994. And, uh, and uh, we never got any funding. We, we operated our, 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 um, our uh, we did our observations over a six year period of time. We, it was an international collaboration. We got um, turned down by NASA and NSF every year. We got excuses like uh, planets don't form around M stars and planets don't form around binary systems either. So of course, um, it's kind of silly to get critiqued like that because of course nobody at the time knew whether or not planets could form around M, M stars whether you could have a planet form in a stable orbit around a binary system. But you'll note that in 1995, they predicted that we would find planets first through indirect signatures, like through radial velocity. They were absolutely right about that. 
of course, in October of 1995, the first planet around a normal star, 51 Peg, was discovered by Mayor and Kalos. And then Paul Butler and, and George Marcy followed up and, and found many other planets that they'd been observing for a long time, but had not thought to look for planets in, in orbits of three or four days around their star, because of course, Jupiter-sized planets can't form that close to their star. Uh, they also predicted that astrometry would uh, yield us planets. Um, that really hasn't happened in a big way yet, but it's about to happen with Gaia. Uh, they predicted that, that we would observe disks, which we certainly have, that we would eventually image Jupiters, which we have, and then we'd start to do um, spectroscopy and we would observe uh, and image systems of planets, which we have. And then at some point in the, in the future, we would obtain detailed images of these planets, which is something we're on the way to do, but no, we're close right at this moment. But what you'll see is that in this report, they predicted that transits would not play a role in finding extrasolar planets. In fact, at the time in 1995, gravitational microlensing was seen as the golden child that would allow us to find Earth mass planets from the ground without the need to go to space. And it turns out that that is incorrect. Um, gravitational microlensing is a, a wonderful technique for finding extrasolar planets, but you need a, a baseline. You need um, observations separated in space in order to uh, reduce the degeneracies in the signal that you see with gravitational microlensing. And so NASA is actually building a mission called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, who, one of whose primary purposes will be to find planets using gravitational microlensing from space. Okay, so uh, Kepler is all about um, finding Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. And we do that by observing transiting planets. As the cartoon on the lower left shows you, we're looking for occasions when a planet crosses the face of its star from our point of view, causing a drop in brightness that lasts typically from an hour for a hot Jupiter like 51 Peg B, uh, to uh, typically 10 hours is the average transit time for an Earth-sized planet in an Earth-like orbit around a sun-like star. Um, the central transit of Mars, for example, would be 16 hours long. So that gives you a sense of the time scale of the signatures we're looking for. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how this has unfolded over time. And so that XKCD cartoon uh, was, was drawn about 2012 here. Um, and uh, you'll see that the radial velocity technique was very, uh, was the first technique that yielded a lot of fruit. Of course, the first planets we found were around pulsars using pulsar tiding. And there were three of those uh, identified in 93 and 94. Um, and essentially uh, in 1995, we did find 51 Peg B. And then when we found the 20th planet, which was HG 209458B, it was the first one that actually was transiting its star. And then at that point in time, uh, people started looking for transiting planets um, from the ground and started achieving success uh, with that. And you can see over time, that uh, the sensitivity of the rate of velocity searches improved and got us down to um, planet masses and sizes near uh, and uh, about the size of, of Earth. Most of those are using infrared sensors, um, so they're not operating in the visible and they're looking at M stars. Uh, and then you can see that uh, with Kepler, we had our first proposal in 1993, we had a second one in 94, 96, 98, 2000. And then at the end of that cycle for the 2000 discovery proposal cycle, we were selected for launch. Um, the good news was we were selected for launch. The bad news NASA told us was, you're not gonna get any money for a year and you'll you won't be launching 2005, you'll be launching 2007. Uh, there were several programmatic stutter steps there with the budget um, at headquarters. Um, but um, after we solved all the problems and got everything together, we were managed to uh, launch in uh, 2009 in March. And so you see that we started finding planets uh, right off the bat. It was a very exciting time to be part of mission um, to get that data down for the very first time and look at it uh, and know that nobody's ever seen data like that from a mission like this before. Um, we got really good at finding planets. You can see that um, we invented statistical techniques for uh, validating um, statistically planets, especially in multiple transiting planet systems where you don't see just one planet signature, but you see two, three, four, five, or six or more, uh, all transiting the same star. And so there were um, uh, two big slugs of, of multiple transiting planet system 
confirmations there. And then we're still finding planets in the Kepler data. I'm uh, collaborating with some data scientists in machine learning at Ames and Intelligent Systems Division. And we recently announced that we were able to, st st to statistically validate 301 new planets uh, in the planet candidates that had remained unresolved um, from Kepler earlier. And uh, other people are looking at that as well. So very exciting time now to see that we have not one or two or three methods for finding planets, but you can see that we have uh, quite the handful, about six different uh, techniques for finding planets, all of which are starting to bear fruit if they haven't already done so. Now, Kepler ended its operations in 2018 uh, in October. In April of that year, on April 18th, actually, uh, the Transing Exoplanet Survey satellite launched, and you can start seeing planets that it discovered. All right, so this is a time lapse of, of planet radius and Earth units on the left. And on the x-axis, it's orbital period in days, and there's the symbol of the Earth at, the, at one year, and one Earth radius. So the hot Jupiters are being found. We start seeing uh, transing planets from the ground. Um, we start seeing some microlensing planets and some imaging planets. And of course, here comes Kepler. That's the first big slug of uh, multiples, uh, second big slug of multiple transing systems. Uh, Tess comes on the scene. Um, and so uh, here we are. We've uh, discovered with Kepler um, over 3,000 planets. Uh, TESS has discovered 269 to date. There are over 400 transiting planets discovered from the ground or other, other um, missions like Caro. And all told, we have uh, 5,164. So um, patience and perseverance does pay off. Many of these missions um, uh, take a long time to convince our, our peers that they're worth, uh, worth funding. Kepler really required that we uh, have backside illuminated CCDs, which weren't available until the mid 90s. Uh, before that time, frontside illuminated CCDs had quantum efficiencies of roughly 50%. Uh, but with backside illuminated CCDs, the quantum efficiency is 90, 95%. And so that meant that we could collect twice the light with the same size aperture, making a discovery class mission, uh, a, you know, a feasible mission for Kepler to carry out its job. We also needed um, planets to find. And so part of the hesitancy was, hey, maybe there aren't that many planets out there to find. So why would we launch a mission like Kepler uh, if all we're going to find is eclipsing binaries? And there were many astronomers who uh, thought this way. Um, so we really needed the early discoveries of the hot Jupiters and the, and the gas giant planets in order for us to uh, be in the game. And the discovery of the first transiting planet really um, was uh, the last puff of wind in the sails allowed Kepler to be selected for launch. So one of the amazing discoveries that came out of Kepler, uh, so this is a histogram, planet radius on the x-axis, number of planets on the y-axis. We have Earths and super Earths. You can see that we don't find a whole lot of planets with Kepler that are above about four Earth radii. So we do find Jupiters, but not many of them, and Saturns. Um, Neptune is about four times the size of Earth. And so most of the planets we find are between one Earth radius and four Earth radii. And of course, we don't have anything in our own solar system in that size range. We've got Earth at one Earth radius, and then we've got Neptune, uh, but we don't have any in between. So most of the planets that we found outside of our own solar system are planets unlike those that we're familiar with. We've never traveled to them. We've never sent a spacecraft to them. Uh, we've never directly imaged them in any detail. And, and so they're a big mystery. Are these planets um, more like mini Neptunes that have uh, you know, ice giants with, with extended atmospheres, hydrogen, helium, a lot of water and ice? Or are they more like um, super Earths where they are, are rocky and some of them might be uh, more massive, maybe five Earth radii or so with a thin envelope of atmosphere around them. Uh, and so we started getting hints to this actually when Gaia, after Gaia launched and started returning uh, data and releasing um, updated stellar parameters for, for Kepler stars hosting planets, we found that there was a gap in this histogram. So uh, there was a hint of a gap before we had those updated stellar parameters. But Gaia really told us this gap was real. So we believe that there are two kinds of planets in this distribution, that there are Earths and super-Earths that are rocky predominantly, and that have thin atmospheres, much like Earth does, 
and that there are then above about two Earth radii. Most of those planets are more like mini Neptunes than, than like large Earth-like bodies. So um, very exciting to see that uh, there are a lot of planets out there and that many of them are totally unlike those that we have in our own solar system. Well, how hard is it to find good planets? Um, Jupiter turns out is pretty easy to find from the ground. In fact, with um, amateur astronomers with, with about $1,000 worth of equipment can follow up uh, the hot Jupiters and, and gas giants that we found with Kepler with TESS. And in fact, because TESS only observes a uh, typical star for 27 days every two years, that means there's a lot of opportunity for amateur astronomers to follow up and help um, contribute to the science of extrasolar planets that we're finding with TESS. So on the left, we have a silhouette of a Jupiter-sized planet transiting the sun. And here's a Kepler planet that was about 10 Earth radii, so a little bit smaller than uh, Jupiter. And its uh, orbital period is 331 days. And you can see that it causes about a, a percent drop in brightness. And that's because Jupiter is about 10 times smaller than the sun by radius. Earth is 10 times smaller still. And so that means the uh, size or depth of the transit from an Earth is a part per 10,000, uh, which is a precision photometrically that's very difficult to achieve uh, from the ground because of, of transparency variations. And because of the atmosphere, you've got weather, um, stars twinkle as we all know because of the atmosphere and uh, day-night cycle weather makes it very difficult to do this kind of job from the ground. You never know when a star is gonna wink at you when a planet crosses its face from our point of view. So you wanna be in space above the atmosphere, well away from the earth and the moon. And you wanna be observing as continuously as possible in order to be able to find these weak signatures that occur uh, very rarely. The duty cycle is very low, you know, 10 hours per year or so. On the lower right, we have uh, one of the first Earth-sized planets that we found with Kepler. I believe this is Kepler 20, well, it's Kepler 20E or 20F. Um, it's a little bit smaller, um, 0.9 Earth radii and a uh, 20-day period. You can see in the light curve uh, folded at the orbital period, you can see the signature, but you can see it's much noisier than the one above from the Jupiter-sized planet. See if I can advance now. Ah, okay. So here's our field of view for Kepler, launched March 7th of 2009. This was our field of view. We had 84 CCD detectors. These were about one inch by two inches on a side. Uh, the focal plane itself was about a foot across. It was the largest focal plane at the time that had been built and launched into space by NASA. And at the time, it was considered a gargantuan field of view. So here's the full moon, which could fit in the gaps between the CCD modules in our focal plane. So 116 square deg uh, degrees were imaged onto this focal plane at the start of the mission. We did lose a couple modules over time. Our requirement was to be imaging at least 100 square degrees, which we did quite easily. All right, so uh, that was Kepler 20E because uh, it was a little smaller than Earth. Kepler 20F is a little bit bigger. This is actually the light curve for Kepler 20 on the bottom in the green. And you can see it has all these uh, wiggles in it. These um, large scale up and down wiggles are caused by spot modulation as the star is spots and as it rotates, the spots uh, transit across the face of the star causing the integrated brightness um, that we measure to change over time. This is actually uh, noise from the point of view of finding these weak signatures, these transit events, um, but it's information that tells us much more about the system. Uh, it turns out that if you know the effective temperature of the star and you can measure the rotation period, then you can estimate the age of the star. Of course, the planets and the star form together. And so we can estimate the age of the planet system itself. Uh, the hair hanging down are transits of the various bodies in the system the smallest ones of which are, would be really quite hard to see uh, unless you fold the data as, as was shown on the previous slide. But it tells you a little bit about the, the challenges of finding planets in this data. Well, speaking of Star Wars, um, I told you that I first got into this field because I was having lunch with Lawrence Doyle and other SETI Institute scientists at the time who got me involved in this international collaboration to find planets around CM Drac. We never did find planets there. It turns out that planets don't tend to form around tight eclipsing binary systems. CMDRAC has an or orbital period of 1.26 days, um, but it's nearly perfectly edge on, so perfectly aligned to find transiting planets if they exist. 
Uh, but Lawrence Doyle was the first author on the Kepler 16b, which was the first circumbinary planet uh, found um, by Kepler or anybody else. And George Lucas uh, gave us permission to use this image of Luke Skywalker looking at the double sunset of Tatooine from uh, the original Star Wars movie. Um, we found about a dozen of these systems. They probably are much more common than would be indicated by the number of systems we've found. Uh, but the signatures can't be found using the same algorithms or the normal algorithms we use for finding transiting planets because they don't occur according to, they aren't regularly spaced. It's not a per perfectly periodic um, system of, of transits every, every orbital period. Kepler 35 was um, a system where uh, the planet actually is in the habitable zone of the star. So there may be more habitable zone planets in circumbinary systems than around single stars. We found a lot of other interesting things as well. Uh, this is uh, KIC 12557548B. Um, uh, my pipeline found the signature of this planet every time we searched. But uh, if you look at the light curve, especially the one on the lower right, you'll see something strange. It seems like there's a transit happening every 16 hours, but it's changing its depth quite strongly. In fact, there are times, like at the beginning of this data record here, where hardly the transits are, are very shallow. And uh, so what's going on here? It turns out that this is a very special system. We only know of a couple of these types of systems where the planet is actually disintegrating before our very eyes. It's orbiting a K star, an orbit that's close enough so that it's actually photo evaporating. Um, the radiation is blowing, is evaporating the material, it's, it's blowing off, and then it uh, cools and condenses and forms a comet-like tail. And so we're not seeing the planet itself, we're actually seeing the tail uh, of this dusty tail across the face of the star. And the modulation of the depth of the transit is being caused by uh, the variation in brightness of the star because it's a spotted star. And uh, uh, this was controversial uh, when it was first released. People went out for several years, had different ideas of what might be causing this. All of those alternate uh, theories failed. And then a study was done by a group that showed a strong correlation between um, the depth of transit and which side of uh, the star the, the planet was facing and showed that when it was on the bright, uh, less spotted side, that uh, the transits were deeper because that's when more radiation was there to evaporate the surface of the planet. We also found the first examples of exocomet signatures in visible light. Um, so the, this is um, a panel a collection of, of six such exocomet signatures we found with Kepler. And we also um, uh, were a great observatory for um, doing astroseismology and for doing other kinds of astrophysics. This is an ROIRE type star, and I hope this plays. So let me know if you can hear it. If not, uh, let me know. I can actually play that on my um, other computer. I hope you're hearing it. Sounds kind of like a purring cat. I'm not hearing it yet, John. Oh, you're not. Okay. If you give me just a moment. Take your time. All right. I'm just blown away by exocomets. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I've had this problem with Zoom. Zoom doesn't always automatically allow you to play sound files. But luckily, I have this on my other computer, so I will play it for you. I hope you're able to hear it now. I'm sorry, I don't think I hear it yet. Oh, okay. Let's sorry. See. My wife says I have bad hearing. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Keep on going, okay. So this is 90 days of data, and of course, I've sped it up so that we can hear it. Um, it's very interesting. So uh, the fact that the envelope, the oscillations uh, change their intensity over time, that's known as the Blaschko effect. We've known about these stars for a little over 100 years. Um, and they're kind of like Cepheid variables in the sense that they, they're, they're standard candles. Um, 
and uh, they oscillate radially. And so essentially it's like a pot of boiling water with a lid on it. So there's a, a layered atmosphere that's normally relatively opaque. And as it heats up, it ionizes, becomes more transparent, the radiation escapes. And so the star becomes much brighter over the course of a couple of hours. And then it takes about 12 hours for it to, um, for it to cool down and for the uh, atmosphere to then, uh, uh, then become neutral again. And so it becomes dimmer over that time and then the process repeats. Uh, this was a very exciting find by Kepler very early, early on. This was Kepler Object of Interest 54. And for a brief moment, Ron Gillen thought this might be the signature of a transiting um, uh, black hole. But um, in fact, it turned out that this is a system known as a heartbeat star. This was a Kepler discovery. We know of um, about 50 or 60 of these. These are cases where you have stars that are in highly eccentric orbits. These were two A stars, nearly the same size and effective temperature. And uh, they actually um, uh, get very close together and they are essentially stretching each other out and perturbing the shapes of the star. And, and they're uh, actually the oscillations then are resonating their resonances um, in the system. And so I'll play this for you. And it's the 90th and 92nd um, harmonic that is being excited that causes these um, wiggles. Oh, I have to play it on here, sorry. So I, I don't know how many of you um, grew up with tube radios. My grandfather had a old tube radio. Um, I remember listening to it as a child and uh, and this kind of reminds me of some of the signals you might hear on, on the shortwave once in a while. <laughs> kind of like the fact that it sounds like it's, uh, like it's an old time radio. All right, and then we found lots of multiple transiting planet systems. So this is one of the first Kepler orreries that was a uh, visualization put together by Dan Fabricki at the time. Um, it was just absolutely fascinating. We had no idea when we launched with Kepler what we would find. All of our predictions were based on our own solar system. So we predicted that by the end of the mission, if we were very lucky, we would find at least about 50 Earth-sized planets, um, all in one year period orbits around their sun-like star. Uh, the, in the end, uh, we found a lot of different things, uh, much different than that. So the fact that we found so many compact uh, multiple transiting planet systems tells us that our, our picture of how planetary systems form is in general correct, and that is you have a collapsing um, protoplanetary disk, it, it collapses, uh, the nebula collapses into a disk, it spins, the central part then uh, aggregates a lot of material to become the star, and then the material then can um, form the planets in the outer parts of the disk. And many of these systems are dynamically packed. And so they can't be pushed uh, closer together, the planets in the system, without becoming dynamically unstable. So this tells us that um, planetary systems, system formation in some sense is very easy. And uh, otherwise we wouldn't see all these systems that we found with Kepler. Now I'm gonna turn uh, the table a little bit and talk a little bit about the science data processing that we do. Uh, that was my principal contribution was to design many of the algorithms, including the transiting planet search algorithm for Kepler and for TESS. Um, and so I won't go through this diagram in detail. We had a science pipeline here in, in orange um, where we calibrated the image pixels. We um, did the photometric analysis to um, basically um, sum the counts, the digital counts and the images of each of the stars in each frame. And then uh, there are instrumental systematics that you have to identify and remove in order to be able to find the planets. In fact, uh, many of the instrumental signatures are much larger in intensity and, and range than the signatures of the planets we're trying to find. So for example, uh, it was tip, uh, the focus changes that we saw with Kepler uh, during the worst part, the worst season, um, when we were actually uh, uh, looking over the sun, uh, we had changes in the baseline flux of plus or minus 1%. And of course, we're trying to find signatures of planets that are uh, one part per 10,000. So much smaller than some of the instrumental signatures we had to identify and remove. Uh, once we've removed those, then we can do the transiting planet search. 
when we find transit-like signatures in the data, then we subject those uh, light curves to a suite of diagnostic tests. This is a summary page out of our data validation report. We have a detrended light curve up here with uh, markers for when the transits are occurring. Um, and then when we fold that at the period of the planet, then we can uh, see whether or not it looks more consistent. We zoom in on the third panel down. This is a nice U-shaped kind of flat bottom. Uh, so that's consistent with being a planet. We uh, look at the odd and the even transit depths. Um, we look for um, whether we can find weak signatures of eclipse of secondary eclipses. Sometimes when you find those, it's not a secondary eclipse of a, of a star, but rather um, a secondary eclipse when a hot Jupiter goes behind its star and then you see a drop in brightness because the thermal radiation from the planet disappears when it goes behind its star. That's a very exciting signature to be able to find. Um, and then one of the most important things we do is we do uh, different image centroiding on the images where we um, take the difference of the, uh, of the in transit versus the out of transit images um, near, you know, in the neighborhood of the transit. And we centroid that difference image. And that uh, should look like a star profile located at the source of the, of the, of the transit. And that allows us to determine whether or not it's located the source is located consistent with being on the target we're looking at. And when that doesn't happen, uh, this is a great, uh, really powerful technique for allowing us to identify when you have a background eclipsing binary that's causing the signature and the background eclipsing binary happens to be in the aperture. Uh, so the, it's, it's images overlapping that of the target star and it might be uh, causing 50% deep eclipses on, on the binary, but it's diluted by the by the target star flux. And so instead of being 50% deep, it might be 0.1% deep or 0.01% deep. And of course, we don't want to be fooled by background eclipsing binaries and think that they're planets. So this is a very important and perhaps one of the most important tasks uh, to deal with when you're trying to validate or confirm uh, an extrasolar planet is to determine that it indeed is not a uh, background eclipsing binary. And it looks like somebody has uh, a question. I don't see it. Okay, I saw I saw a note that somebody raised their hand. Let me um, let me yeah. let me take a look here. I do not see one right now. Okay. All right. So um, yeah. So this is this is the information that uh, gets poured over by the scientists who are on the vetting teams that then decide which objects to promote uh, to the Kepler or TESS object of interest status. In which case, it will be turned over to the follow up program where it'll be subjected to follow-up um, observations with a variety of facilities in order to A, refine the uh, stellar parameters, which gives us better information. If you know the star's radius better, you know the planet's radius better, for example. And we also look, uh, do high resolution imaging to look to see if there's a, a star in the background that's not in the catalog that could be causing the signature we're seeing for example, um, and when possible, we do radial velocity observations in order to, to measure the mass of, of the planets we're finding. Okay, so Kepler taught us that planets are everywhere. In fact, on average, every star has at least one planet. So what comes next? Well, um, we're four years into the next story, and that is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, wh whose main purpose is to discover Earths and super-Earths in the solar neighborhood. So it launched on April 18th of uh, 2000, uh, 2018, and this is a picture of the launch um, on a SpaceX launch vehicle. And, and this uh, illustration uh, tells you the difference between the two missions. So Kepler was looking in a light cone about 100 square degrees, about the size of the palm of your hand held at arm's length. And we were looking typically between 1,000 and 3,000 light years away at the targets we were observing with Kepler. And uh, a uh, test though is near all sky survey. It's observing stars that are typically 10 times closer and 100 times brighter than those that we observe with Kepler, which allows us to then um, follow up and measure uh, the masses of many of these planets using radial velocity. And in fact, um, we're trying to look at all the M stars that lie within a 200 light year radius of the sun. So uh, the primary mission was the first two years of, of the test mission. We just completed the first extended mission in, uh, at the end of August of this year and commenced the second extended mission starting September 2nd. 
And uh, this is a basically a collage of the um, of the field of view uh, that we looked at uh, over the uh, over the first year on the left. That was the southern hemisphere, and then we observed the northern hemisphere in the second year of the primary mission. And the reason why the why this looks uh, more like a turkey on the right is because um, there's a season when when the Earth and the Moon are are more likely to get in the field of view, and because they're in the ecliptic, we chose to tilt the the spacecraft up in order to raise the field of view, so that we would avoid some of the scattered light from the Earth and the Moon. And you'll see a little bit of how that works uh, a little bit later. So this is a movie that Roland Bannerschback put together. He's the deputy principal investigator for TESC, showing the Earth and the Moon. And this is basically a movie where you can see what's going on on uh, the detector. So uh, TESS has four cameras with fields of view that are butted together 24 degrees wide and 96 degrees high. Normally the pole camera, camera four, is uh, located centered on the celestial pole. Um, that's where the James Webb Space Telescope's continuous viewing zone is. Uh, stars that fall on that detector, there are 500 square degrees where we can observe those stars nearly continuously for a year at a time. Whereas most stars, especially on cameras one and two, are only observed for about 27 days. And because we keep on going from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere and then back again, uh, that means there's a two year gap in between those observations. As you can see, observing with TESS is very different than observing with Kepler. With Kepler, we never had the Earth or the Moon anywhere near um, our field of view until um, we got into beyond the Kepler mission. And we did turn the spacecraft and take a picture of of the Earth, and we had everybody waving at Kepler <laughs> at the time that we did that observation. Okay, and we found some circumbinary planets with TESS as well. So this is the first circumbinary planet, and I'm afraid I can't read the name um, here because it's covered by the zoom controls. Um, but again, and this one was found actually uh, interesting enough by a by an intern at Goddard. It was like his third day, I think, on the job. When, um, when he was asked to look um, by eye manually through light curves of, of eclipsing binaries and found the signature of this planet on its very third day. Boy, I would have loved to have found an exoplanet on the third day that I started this work, uh, which was in 1994, so it wasn't until 2009. <laughs> Ron, I anyway. Ron, I remember when that happened. It hit the news. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, famous. very exciting. <laughs> And then here's TOI 700. So this was the, the first planetary system that we found with TESS that has a habitable zone planet. Uh, it has two interior planets to the habitable zone, 700B and 700C. Um, you can see they're slightly different sizes as well. And uh, the third one, TOI 700D is on the inner edge of the habitable zone. And uh, we found the signature of a fourth planet um, back in uh, actually, in 2020, but uh, they're still working on the discovery paper for that one, but that's TOI 700E and that's on the outer edge of the habitable zone. So uh, that's gonna be dropping sometime soon. I uh, reviewed uh, uh, the early version of that paper and uh, we hope to hear back from the journal soon. But it's, it's just really exciting to find um, habitable zone planets, especially multiple in multiple transiting planet systems. All right, so we also do a lot of other science. Uh, we did this with Kepler during K2, um, where we hopscotched around the ecliptic to observe fields of view for 80 days or so after the death of the second of four reaction wheels we had on Kepler. And so this is actually work that um, that uh, a group of astronomers in, in Europe, the um, TESS Astro Seismic Science Consortium, we had, we had the same group with about 600 astronomers around the world participating to study um, oscillations of stars. And uh, so uh, this is one of their products, but this is a great little movie that shows you a bit about how uh, TESS makes its observations. So each one of these is a field of view. So you can see that every 27 degrees we turn and rotate basically around the pole. And that's the primary mission. And uh, these are all the red giants that they were observing in the, in the full frame images. And this is telling us a lot about the uh, history and formation of the Milky Way by uh, doing follow-up analyses of these stars and understanding their composition and where they came from. All right. 
And so let me pause this. I will go to my other presentation up here. So one of the things they did was they sonified um, light curves of these stars. I hope you can hear this once I, let's see where this go. Okay. Actually, that's the next one. Right, so this is a sonification of 74 Draconis. It's about five and a half times the size of the sun. And now we're getting to Dasik, which is 12 times the sun size. So it's bigger and hence, because it's a bigger bell, it's ringing at a lower tone. And then we're going to hear 42 Draconis. This is 20 times the sun size. And it's a much deeper tone. And if I had really good speakers, it would sound a lot better than it does here. Um, that's the interesting thing. I, I made lots of sound files for Kepler data. Uh, many of them were taken up by musicians and artists who've incorporated them into their work. And I remember um, uh, giving a, a talk at a planetarium. And uh, it was the first time I'd heard some of these sounds on a really big speaker system. And it was like, wow, I can hear a lot more than I can on my tinny little computer speaker. <laughs> At any rate, um, yeah, it is a lot of fun. It's interesting that um, that you can uh, learn a lot about stars by the sounds that they make. And of course, they're great big balls of, of fluid and you have star quakes, disturbances, turbulence, that uh, is mechanical entry that creates uh, sound waves that travel um, down into the interior, get reflected back up, and they will um, then keep on doing that. And if they come around to the part, to the same position they started, they'll keep on being excited. And so you get these quasi periodic oscillations that can maintain coherence for weeks at a time. And uh, just like with bells, by studying the frequencies of the tones that these uh, sounds create, uh, they change the shape of the star. And so we can hear them by measuring the change in brightness of the star over time. And then uh, by, by measuring the frequencies of these oscillations, we can understand the composition and structure of these stars and learn a lot about them. For example, we can measure their masses to a couple percent and their radii to a couple percent. We're not resolving the disks of their stars. We're simply measuring the, the acoustics of the star in order to infer this information, which I think is quite fascinating. Um, I think uh, it'd be hard for me to estimate somebody's mass and size to within 5% just by, by hearing what they're sounding like. <laughs> any rate, um, so uh, TESS is all about learning more about the planets. Uh, that's, that's the reason why we launched it, and it's working quite well. So on this graph, we're going to start talking about precise radial velocity ma masses of transiting planets that we found. Uh, the y-axis is radius and Earth units from 1 to 5. We've got Earth masses from 1 to 40. We've got Venus and Earth on this green line, which is uh, silicate composition, Earth-like composition. 100% iron on the bottom there, that's a stripped iron core. And then as we uh, add water, we can have planets that are more like water worlds with 50% or 100% water vapor. As you go up those curves to the aqua and the, the blue-green. And then uh, if you have a, a basically a massive planet uh, with 0.1% hydrogen envelope, then it can lie on this orange curve. And then as you add more and more hydrogen, then the curve goes up to the right. We have Uranus and Neptune here, ice giants right here in this region of this diagram. And then 5% hydrogen is above there. So you can see that um, once you have the mass and the radius of the planet, you've got the bulk density and you can start arguing about what the planet is made of. But there's this interesting regime where there's quite a bit of degeneracy that you can't just use the density alone to determine whether it's a water world or whether it's a gas giant. Okay, so here are the precise RV masses that exist today uh, without test data. So there are about 40, I think there are 42 um, masses, uh, uh, well, planets pictured here. Uh, these are ones where the error bars are at least five sigma. So these are highly precise determinations of both the mass and the radius. And even with this data, you can start seeing some patterns. We see a cluster of planets along the Earth-like composition curve. And then we see a, a cluster of planets that are kind of in this interesting region where um, we don't know whether they are water worlds or whether they're um, more like gas giants. And then, of course, we have these planets that are clearly gas giants that tail off to the upper right. 
These are about 60 of the 100 RV masses from tests, only the ones that are at least five sigma. And you see from this that um, we're just doing a bang up job. Our uh, level one requirement was to find at least 50 planets smaller than uh, Neptune for which we can measure the masses. We have uh, 100 of those. Um, and then um, these are the most precise ones, but you can see that we are finding a very interesting collection of, of planets on this diagram. And then when we combine all the highly precise RV masses from all sources, this is the picture we have today. And so what's gonna be really interesting in the next little while with help from James Webb is we'll be able to uh, determine whether the planets that lie in this cluster uh, around between uh, two and a half or so Earth masses, uh, Earth radii and between six and 20 Earth, ma Earth masses, what those are made of. And I think that's gonna be a really exciting time. Um, but you also see there's a strong cluster of planets that clearly are, are more Earth-like. And we see that this cuts off at about 10 Earth masses, which is really interesting because George Weatherhill, way back when in the, in the, in the 70s was predicting that um, the formation of Jupiter's, you would accrete a five to 10 Earth mass core before you could then uh, start aggregating hydrogen easily and, and have a runaway growth to create a Jupiter-like planet. Formation of Jupiter's is still um, somewhat of a mystery. It's, it's uh, still uh, difficult to um, come up with a model uh, that explains Jupiter's because they have to aggregate so much hydrogen before the star turns on and blows the gas and the dust away. So Jupiter's have to form relatively rapid, rapidly in a, in a um, solar system. This is a temperate Neptune-sized planet orbiting nearby dwarf NLTT 24399. It's only 30 parsecs away. Uh, this planet is uh, a little bit smaller than Neptune. It's got a, a period of 24 days, uh, 15 Earth masses, and uh, equilibrium temperature of 330K. And we may be able to directly detect atmospheric escape via Doppler velocity observations. And it's an exciting target for James Webb. Um, this is uh, from a paper by Jen Burt, who's a member of the test science team. So very, very exciting planet to find. And uh, 25 of the targets, exoplanet targets that are gonna be observed in cycle one for James Webb are, are uh, test planets or test planet candidates. And so we're gonna start hearing a lot more about, about what's going on with James Webb and exoplanets. We do have, uh, uh, the initial detection of carbon monoxide in atmosphere WASP 39B. Um, Natalie Bataille, who was uh, one of my one, one of the other junior scientists who joined Kepler um, in the early days around, she joined the team around 1998 um, and became the mission scientist uh, during the primary mission of Kepler. Uh, her team uh, was the one that uh, that made this discovery. And uh, I just talked to her last night at the Frank Drake, and it seems that there's gonna be a press release and some new information coming out uh, next week. So I look forward to hearing what that is. Well, the great thing about this is that James Webb using near spec, so it's a bright object time series spectroscopy, can make observations at different um, infrared wavelengths. And so um, the fact is carbon monoxide uh, absorbs more light in the um, 4.3 micron uh, wavelength than it does at 4.7 or 3.0. And so this difference in the transit depth can be used to interpret the abundance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this planet. And here's um, the spectrum that was retrieved by near spec showing this carbon dioxide feature. So quite exciting that uh, we, we're going from just uh, collecting shiny objects, discovering planets, um, to actually characterizing them and learning much more about them. Uh, so very exciting time, and especially to think that this has happened in a very brief amount of time. Um, you know, uh, the first planet around a normal star was found only in 1995, so just a little over 25 years ago. And, uh, and here we are, um, not just finding planets, but learning much more about them. And uh, that's just going to continue to accelerate over the next several years and decades. And of course, uh, what we hope to do eventually is to detect biomarkers through transit spectroscopy. And so that can be done in a couple different ways. You can do that um, by looking at the uh, 
at the difference in the spectrum of the star in transit versus out of transit. And you can also look what happens during the secondary eclipse when the planet disappears behind the star. And that, uh, that shows you what the thermal emission from the planet is doing. Um, uh, eventually, what you really want to do is you want to do reflectant spectroscopy, where you're looking at, at, at starlight that is then reflected off of the surface of the planet. So you can see much deeper into the atmosphere and learn a lot more about those planets. And that's something that we hope to do in the next couple of decades. So NASA does indeed have a number of, of um, of telescopes it wants to build. Uh, w first is now known as the Grant Nancy Grace Roman uh, Telescope, and then the last decadal uh, survey out for astrophysics um, came up with a, a mission that's in between the habitable exoplanet imager and Lou Guar. Uh, so we look forward to seeing what happens with that. Uh, ESA is not sitting on its hands. It's uh, building a, a mission to detect transiting planets called PLATO, which hopes to find uh, Earth-like planets and Earth-like orbits uh, around stars that it will be observing. CHAOPS is a, is a uh, characterization mission that observes only one planet at a time, but makes very precise transit photometry observations to help us refine the um, radii of the planets we're finding. And there's been a great deal of synergy between CHAOPS and TESS. Gaia has just blown us all out of the water in some sense. Um, by providing all this information about the stars that we're observing, uh, greatly enriching the science results that we're obtaining. And then um, we'll probably have to join forces with ESA to build the New Worlds Telescope. So um, it's been quite a sweep of, of missions from Hubble to Spitzer to Kepler onto James Webb. And uh, this, I think this is just really just the beginning and we feel, we should all feel very fortunate to live at this time when we see, um, Finally, the answer to this question, are there planets around other stars? And the next question, of course, is what are these planets made of? And uh, is there life on, this on these planets? Can we find and detect signatures of biology in the atmosphere of, the, of these planets using uh, spectroscopy? So um, I remember being a child in, in Florida. My parents both um, worked at Kennedy Space Center, lying in the summer grass, looking up into the night sky, wondering if there were planets orbiting the stars I was looking at, whether there were beings on those planets looking up into it. They're not night sky in our direction wondering the same thing. So uh, perhaps we'll be lucky and, and get the answer to that question sooner than we might hope. So with that, um, this is a picture of, of uh, my teammates on at the Science Processing Operations Center. This is the hyperwall at, the, at NASA's Advanced Supercomputing Division. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. A great talk. Thank you. Enjoyed that very much. All right. OK. Have we got any questions? Uh, Dave, I'll start with you. You always <laughs> have questions. So while other people are, are formulating theirs, you probably already have a whole list of them in your mind. Well, I have several. Um, and John, the reason they made me program director is because I ask about 50% of the questions. So okay, very good. Our award is for <laughs> um, I have a, uh, to begin with, I have a, a, a geeky technical question. And then I have a broad uh, question. I don't know about New World's telescope. Can you tell, describe a little bit about what it's going to be like? Uh, well, um, we'll have to see what it's like. Um, so the last Decadal survey did come up with a, um, a, a mission design of sorts that was kind of like an intermediate um, uh, design uh, from Louvoir. And let's see, it's been a while since I've looked at that. Um, yeah, just the Vegas outlines are sufficient for now, obviously. Right. Right, so LUVAR is a concept. It's a large ultraviolet optical infrared telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it basically, let's see. Let's look at the design. So it's envisioned as long-term obs observatory for new generation of astronomers. And so it has a very large sunshade, and then it has a, a boom. Um, let's see, where is it operating? So it, like, like uh, James Webb, it's got to deploy its uh, mirror, much like James Webb, uh -huh. but it's a very different design. 
Um, so it's a much larger aperture. You have a rough idea. And it's operating in ultraviolet. It's a multi-optic spectrograph. Uh, total band pass 100 to 1,000 nanometers. Uh, two by two arc minute field of view, spectral resolution from 500 to 56,000. And apertures four by 420 by 840 individually configurable. It can take up to 840 simultaneous spectra and a far view V imaging mode is enabled. So um, we'll have to see the ultimate plan for that would be able to actually um, image a planet and actually do spectroscopy in the atmosphere of the planet. So it's, it's, wow. it's not gonna give you, you know, a pretty picture of, of the world, but the whole idea is to be able to capture enough light to obtain a spectrum and do detailed reflectance spectroscopy, which is really what you wanna do in order to learn the most that you can about these planets. I, I think spectroscopy is very exciting when you think about mm -hmm. the implications of what it's gonna tell us about these planets. In a way, it's Absolutely. gonna tell us far more information than just a, a pretty picture would. Um, yes. I uh, may I ask a second question, Rich, right now? Or do we have somebody else? Yeah, no, go for it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I was a little confused about the out of transit centroid offset. Could you explain that again for me for those of us that are not very smart? Right. So actually, let's see. Um, I will actually share my screen because there was a panel that I that I did not um, that I thought we wouldn't have time to to do, but I will back up to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That I I I was trying to understand that, and I I, I anyway. Oops. Right. Okay. All right. All right, so I'm going to zoom in, and okay. so this this is what's known as a difference image, and so I'll explain this. So if you look at the upper right, this is the average out of transit image taken, you know, basically a couple of hours outside of transit, and we and it's the same duration that we average over, but as in transit. So if the transit is four hours long, this will be four hours of data on one side plus four hours of data on the other side, so it would be eight hours of data. So this is the average image. Mm -hmm. And then we take the out of transit flux, and this is the in transit flux. So this is the average over the in transit images mm -hmm. um, for that for that star, and we subtract the in transit flux from the out of transit flux. And what should be left over is the image of a star located at the source of the transit like feature. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, what you'll notice is that is that there's this very bright star like profile located not at the target star, which is this little dim star in the middle, but over here to the side. Yeah. And if we look at the at the data validation report, you'll notice that that this is more triangle shaped, V shaped yeah. than U shaped. And so if you just look at this, you know that this is either a grazing transit or it's an eclipsing binary. And most of the time it's going to be a, an eclipsing binary. And in this case, uh, the difference image analysis tells us that it's nowhere close to the star, and it, it's it's a it's a background eclipsing binary. In this case, it's a very much brighter foreground star that happens to be the eclipsing binary. And because what you're seeing is the tails of the eclipsing binary uh, point spread function are leaking into the app photometric aperture for this much dimmer target star, and so we're we're seeing the the eclipses of that binary are superimposed by the wings of the PSF on the photometry that we're extracting from that fundmetric aperture. Got it. So um, now I that's, understand. Yeah, so it's a very powerful technique for um, validating whether or not the transit is happening on the source that you want it to be, as opposed to be uh, being something else in the background. Got it. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, what's the uh, expected lifetime of uh, uh, TESS? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, it turns out that we have over 30 years of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen oh. fuel left at this point. That's wow. the fuel we use to manage the momentum of the reaction wheels that we use uh, to control the pointing and you know attitude of the spacecraft and the instrument. Um, Kepler was sized with uh, 10 years worth of fuel. Uh, even, you know, I think we could have gone for much longer had we not lost that second reaction wheel because mm -hmm. during the K2 mission, we were actually controlling the roll angle of our, of our um, spacecraft using uh, the thrusters every six hours or so. Uh, with TESS, um, 
we have a completely different brand and make of, of reaction wheels. So <laughs> we don't expect <laughs> that those will go bad anytime soon. The ones we launched with uh, for Kepler, we knew um, before we launched, there were problems with those wheels, but Kepler was size such there was only one make and model of reaction wheel that we could use. We couldn't go bigger because we'd have more rumble and we want to achieve the pointing precision that we needed. And if we went smaller, we wouldn't have enough torque to actually control the attitude of the spacecraft. So we're kind of stuck in the middle there. Um, we did uh, do a trade study to see if we could actually attach additional reaction wheels to the spacecraft bus so we'd have greater redundancy. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are other missions to the outer solar system that do that, especially those that have to go through radiation belts. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it turned out that it was just not feasible at the time. And the problem wasn't that we couldn't didn't have space or couldn't afford the mass, but it was more the issue with the cabling that of course running the cables and the electronics um, is a very uh, challenging thing to do. And it was just, it was infeasible because we didn't have enough real estate to make that work, unfortunately. Very interesting. That was an unexpected answer. That's a long time. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bill uh, asks, uh, are we gonna be able to detect the spectra of uh, complex organic compounds such as amino acids or uh, nucleotides? Wow. Um, I think that's pretty far off. So when we talk about yep. the biosignatures that we have in mind, we're talking about gases associated with life that, you know, and so the, the what you'd like to think about is what, what makes life recognizable on a planet like the earth. And, and the fact is, is that um, the system is not in chemical equilibrium. And, and that is that uh, on earth, you find methane, you find oxygen and ozone, and um, that can only happen if the system is not in equilibrium because oxygen likes, likes to react with methane, of course. And so in the end, if you don't have biology that's constantly making and producing these gases, then you either have all oxygen or all methane, no but methane. you don't have a mix. So that's why we talk about finding methane and carbon dioxide and ozone as a marker for oxygen as prototypical examples of biosignatures that tell us that there's life driving uh, that planet out of chemical equilibrium. Hmm. So we hope they have a lot of cows to make it easier for us. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, anyone else? I have one comment. Uh, and I would say, I think the original Star Wars came out in 1978. And uh, gosh, if anybody had just been watching the movie, we would have known that uh, planets <laughs> are uh, binary star systems. Um, uh, rather prophetic, actually, that here's fiction anticipating reality in a, in a wonderful way. Right. Yeah. yeah, the SETI Institute, they like to talk about making science fiction science fact. And that yeah. was something that Frank Drake liked to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so how many planets are we up to now with uh, exoplanets with Tessa's discovery? What's uh, its contribution? Uh, let's see. It's uh, 269, I think, is the, um, is the number. It does change. Every couple of days, you have to check back. Yeah, yeah. That's what's so exciting <laughs> uh, about this. We have, um, in fact, we have um, over 1,000 publications uh, about test using test data that have come out over the last four years. Um, and uh, uh, we have uh, mission papers. We have, let's see, I think I'm up, I keep track of the mission papers that come through where they ask for us to review their papers yeah. and contribute. And we're up in the like 275 or so. So um, it's a phenomenally productive mission from a science perspective. The publication rate for TASS actually exceeds that of Kepler or Hubble. And wow. Kepler was, was, was a little bit more than Hubble there during its prime. Um, so at the, yeah, so the current count is 269 planets as of two days ago. <laughs> so you're discovering more than 50 planets a year, if my math is uh, about right. We are. That's yes. the current rate. Right. right. And we have over 5,000 planet candidates. So the ones we're following up are the ones that are easiest to follow up. Um, it'll take us a longer time to validate or confirm uh, the ones that are not as, the signatures aren't as strong or the, or the stars are much dimmer than the ones for which it's much easier to follow up and, and confirm. I, I, that anticipates another question I was going to ask you, which is, I wanted you to refresh our memory again as to what the, the it sounds like there's three different levels. There's like an incident level, and then, um, can you go over that again? 
as to how the how this emerges? Do you understand what I'm asking? I'm I don't think I quite understand the question you're asking. So yeah, you're talking I mean, about it's, it's like when you have a planet candidate, it's not a planet. Oh, right. Right. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so it's an yeah, so, curve, right? Right. So when we when we search through the like what we call light curves, the measurements of brightness over time, yeah. we're looking for periodic uh, dips in the light curve. And we typically look between uh, a half hour long out to um, 16 hours or so for the durations. And we look over a range of periods um, that span from um, like half a day out to uh, basically the length of the duration of the observation that we're looking at. So we look for at least two transits yeah. um, and then as many as we can find. Uh, so when we find a transit like signature, then we uh, produce, uh, conduct a number of those diagnostic tests that I showed you. Yes. Uh, those get reviewed. We um, That used to be all human vetting was very time intensive. And we've migrated more to a mix of machine learning that allows us uh, to, or algorithms allow us to focus on the ones that are most likely to be planets uh, on tests. There's still human vetting to sort of like make the final decision. But um, you're looking, like humans are looking at a much smaller number uh, signatures than those that we find automatically, the mm -hmm. ones that are more likely to be bona fide planets. Uh, when those get turned over to the follow-up program, they're given object of interest numbers. So we call them TOIs for tests. And with Kepler, it was Kepler objects of interest or, or KOIs. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then observers go to, go to town uh, making observations to confirm it's uh, ideally with tests, you actually, we, we do photometry from the ground and often we can actually directly uh, observe the transits. Uh, we can then measure the masses of radial velocity. We, we do look at high resolution imaging just to uh, look to see if there's a dimmer star that perhaps is not in our catalog that might be causing the trans-like signature, uh, back, a faint background eclipse in binary. And then when the planet actually becomes a planet, when it gets published. So that's the standard that that we follow and all of those discoveries then are, are, uh, are collected on, on the NASA Exoplanet um, uh, Science Institute's website. So they have a, a, a catalog of planets yeah. um, and they also have catalogs of the um, planet candidates from TESS and Kepler. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also collect information about all the other planets as well, microlensing imaging and all that. So, um, so that's free and available to anyone to go to, to Nexi and uh, play around with, um, with the planets there and see the data, have links to all the papers. And in fact, um, the, animated uh, the animated graphics that I showed you were drawn. I, I downloaded the catalog today and, and updated my, my graphics based on that. And what's the website again on that? Nexi. Um, in fact, let me open up a window and I will Put it in the chat if that's okay. Oh, please do. Thank you. No, I love the 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 animation graphics of all the different uh, planets orbiting all the stars. That was just wonderful. Oh, great. Yeah. So this is the website for next sign. Oh, thank you. And. But if you you look for um, exoplanet NASA exoplanet archive. Um, you'll find it. It's hosted by IPAC, associated with Caltech, and that was, uh, you know, the organization supporting Spitzer. We had the uh, your planet curator from down at Caltech. I forget her name right now, but um... uh, Jesse Christensen. Yes, Jesse. We had Jesse. She right. Had yeah, I. She uh, interestingly enough. So I to told you about um, observing CM Drac. Uh, Bill Baruki um, set up uh, the Vulcan camera very early on. This was. Um, Around 1998 was when we uh, put down, 1997 or so is when we put down the production. Um, as soon as we found 51 Peg B, we started building this camera and put it up on Lick Observatory. Uh, uh, that was called Vulcan. Uh, that was on the 120 inch, the, the, the Shane reflector, I assume? Um, no, actually, um, we were in the Crocker Dome. Oh. So this was, uh, yeah, we actually, it's kind of funny because Bill Baruki had uh, Doug Caldwell and myself um, go on eBay and buy a um, <laughs> buy. Yeah, we bought a lens. Uh, it was uh, an old uh, Air Force lens. It was, it was, I can't remember how big it was, um, 10, 12 inches. Uh, the glass was radioactive, but um, Bill, we, we, I was then working for the SETI Institute and 
NASA civil servants and NASA cannot go on public auctions and actually participate in auctions, but because we were not civil servants, we went on to eBay and and, and won. Well, we got lots of those laying around. We could have probably given you some. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we, we may have some in storage, Rich, if you know right. what I mean. Yeah, I do. Right. So, I sure do. So Doug, Doug Caldwell then got funding from NSF to build a similar instrument for to go down to the South Pole to Antarctica. Oh, and Jesse Christensen, and then he hired Jesse Christensen um, to collaborate with him. And she was a, a doctoral student at the time, I believe. And uh, and then I hired her to work on Kepler in 2010. Oh, that's and great. So she that's was in the cool. science office. Yeah, so it's a small world. Oh, it <laughs> is. I, I have another question. Um, uh, sure. Alan Gould has asked, uh, have you written any papers about sonifications and their uses and significance? I'm sorry, I have to interrupt here. Alan Gould <laughs> was the person talking about small world who recommended that Carter's picture be used on the Kepler website. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Alan, Alan works. Well, I don't know if he's still working at Lawrence Hall of Science, but that's Alan. Go ahead. Well, Alan, what if um, I have to say I've given presentations and I've shared my sounds with uh, lots of artists. Um, uh, there, it's just really, it's it's really amazing how how captivating the science is to the general public and also to musicians and artists. So, so um, it's really great to, to have them incorporate these sounds into their work. I have not written any formal papers about it. Um, there are other people who have done sonifications and are using them for public outreach, but also for um, educational purposes for people who are blind. Um, mm -hmm. But I have to say, so I'm sorry to say I re really haven't followed the field um, that closely in the last several years. But hello, Alan. Um, Alan was one of my favorite people who worked with us on Kepler. Um, he was one of the two education and public outreach co-investigators along with Edna uh, DeVore, who um, was at SETI Institute. Uh, so Alan did a, a fantastic, phenomenal job and the Kepler website that he curated uh, was just phenomenal. I was well, really it, sad to it see it It is a go. small world, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> yep. great. All right. Well, um, I, I think... can ask one more question, please. Okay, I'll give you one more, Dave. Oh, just then one got, more. Then we got to okay. close it down. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Limiting magnitude of tests. How far down can you go in brightness? Oh gosh. Well, you know, uh, we were designed principally for sixth and eighth magnitude. Those were the the two, uh, mat, you know, two star magnitudes or brightnesses yeah. that we worked with in terms of designing uh, the system. Um, uh, most of our targets are six, 16th magnitude or brighter in the R band, which is the closest band to the band pass that we have. But guest observers observe down at even at 20th magnitude, especially wow. for extended objects, you know, faint objects, but in very uncrowded fields. Um, it's, yeah. And so one of the things I didn't talk about was the fact that um, TASS, unlike Kepler, so it's, it's about 10 years newer. Um, we have much bigger uh, uh, solid state recorders. And so we actually uh, collect these 64 megapixel full frame images. Originally, it was every half hour during the original primary mission. Um, the compression algorithm that I designed for Kepler, I tweaked it a bit. And uh, we were getting about, we were compressing the data to about 4.5 bits per pixel with Kepler. Wow. We're achieving compression rates at about uh, almost uh, about three bits per pixel with with tests and what that allowed us to do was go from half hour long full frame images every half hour uh, to 10 minute FFIs uh, for the first extended mission. And now in the second extended mission, we're actually collecting FFIs at 200 second cadence. Mm -hmm. So, wow. yeah, so, I mean, we're still observing stars in poster stamps, 20,000 stars at two minutes and a little over 2000 stars at 20 second cadence to look at high you know, high high time resolution for transients, flare yeah. stars, that kind of thing. Um, so um, we won't need those two minute targets uh, for very much longer if we're able to squeeze the cadence down to two minutes from 200 seconds. So you're one of but those really, impression guys. It, wow. Yeah. So um, I mean, that, yeah. I got cool. my cap to you. Okay. That's. I mean, I, I'd say that. Um, where my my contributions to these missions largely are at the intersection between electrical engineering and astronomy. Mm -hmm. And so it's been, I, I think, just a, a, a very delightful experience to be able to take some of the things I 
learned uh, as an electrical engineer, like compression theory, signal detection theory, and that sort of thing, and, and bring it to missions like Kepler and TASS uh, to help help make them feasible and help them succeed. Um, Dave, earlier this evening, uh, you and I were talking about the Wayback Machine, yes, the Internet Archive. So uh, Alan posted the link to the old Kepler Education website, which is oh, archived right. on the Wayback <laughs> Machine. And I just went ahead and put that in the chat window. Oh, so wonderful. It, you may want to open the chat and click on it and bookmark it on your browser if you want to have that uh, for posterity's sake. John, one All more right. thing I want to say before we go, and that is that uh, I met George Lucas before he became famous um, when I was in high school. And oh, wow. it was just okay. outside the Oakland Museum. This is what happened was he was making his student film. He had driven up from SC. I didn't know this at the time. And I met him in front of the old Oakland Museum. And uh, I didn't know who he was or what he was doing. But I was I, I just being the curious teenager that I was, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a movie. And I said, oh, what type of movie is it? He said, oh, it's a science fiction movie. I, I said, well, tell me the name. I'll go see it when it comes out. He said, no, no, you don't understand. It's just a student movie. I said, tell me the name anyway. And he said, it's THX 1138. Yeah. And, that was, and, and later on, I read about the, the trip that he had driven up in this old Ford Fairlane. And I remember seeing the Fairlane and parked in front of the museum there, yeah, just as they were wow. closing. So, it's a small world. It is. Thank you very much, John. I enjoyed it. All right, time. gentlemen. And thank right, well, you, everybody who attended tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at our December event. And uh, until next time. Thanks, John. Th thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Dave. And everybody else, great to see you. Or not see you, Alan, but great to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care, all. All right. Thank you.